introduction to eyeball the three layers or outer fibrous scleron cornea middle vascular choroid layer and the innermost layer is called retina which is nervous layer and this is optic disc and optic nerve now note down the lens is suspended by suspensory ligaments this lens divides the eyeball into two segments the region behind the lens is called posterior segment in front of the lens is called anterior segment the posterior segment is filled with vitreous humor anterior segment with aqueous humor this structure is called iris the iris divides the anterior segment further into anterior chamber and posterior chamber both these chambers are filled with aqueous humor secreted from the ciliary process and drained at the corneoscleral junction we can talk about this in detail under glaucoma now moving on to uveal tract so this middle layer of the eyeball which consists of iris ciliary body and choroid from anterior to posterior this is called uveal tract before moving on to the detail explanation let's talk about few important mcqs in this region this uveal tract that is iris ciliary body and choroid this has the maximum ocular vascular supply so in systemic conditions like toxoplasmosis tuberculosis or even in ocular surgical procedures this layer elicits a maximum immune response because of its rich vascularity and results in a condition called uveitis that is inflammation of uveal tract second most important mcq so that is anterior chamber what is the depth of anterior chamber it is 3 mm this structure is called iris let's draw iris from the front view so what is the question related to iris yes what is the diameter of iris it is 12 mm there is an aperture present in the midline and that is called pupil question related to pupil diameter of pupil that is 3 to 4 mm the point that is the junction between the choroid and ciliary body otherwise the point where the retina ends is called ora serrata now let's talk about the parts of uveal tract in detail so get oriented with this picture choroid iris between them is the ciliary body so this is uveal tract that is the anterior side what is the layer outside the choroid that is sclera and cornea space between the cornea and iris is anterior chamber okay now iris in detail so first we talk about the microscopic structure of iris from anterior to posterior we have anterior limiting membrane just beneath the anterior limiting membrane is the stroma stroma contains fibroblast cells between them we have melanocytes and this number of melanocyte determines the color of your iris maximum number implicates black color 
and minimum number gives blue or green color to the iris we have two important muscles in the iris sphincter pupillae and dilator pupillae beneath the stroma we have two epithelial lining one is anterior epithelium beneath that is the posterior epithelium so now recall all the four layers of iris anterior limiting membrane stroma two important muscles anterior epithelium and posterior epithelium so now consider the iris from the front view take a section of iris so this is the section of iris and there is a partition which divides the iris into outer ciliary zone and inner pupillary zone and this line of demarcation is called collaret just remember the word collaret so now this is all about iris next we move on to ciliary body two important parts of ciliary body pars plicata where there is ciliary processes and flat part is pars plana here note down the stroma of the iris extends behind into the ciliary body as stroma of the ciliary body here also we have connective tissue and collagen fibers one important such muscle in the ciliary body is ciliary muscle and the function of this one is accommodation of lens remember the function of ciliary muscle so here the last two layers of iris that is anterior epithelium and posterior epithelium anterior epithelium continues as the lining into the ciliary body called anterior pigmented epithelium posterior epithelium continues as posterior non pigmented epithelium so this layer posterior non pigmented epithelium secretes the aqueous humor this is all about the ciliary body now moving on to choroid so this is outer surface from outside to inside sclera and just beneath the sclera we have a membrane or lamina called suprachoroidal lamina and the space between the sclera and suprachoroidal lamina is called suprachoroidal space what is the significance of this space the arteries ciliary arteries that is short posterior ciliary arteries and long posterior ciliary arteries from the branches of ophthalmic artery runs in this space that is suprachoroidal space it is one of the important mcq now beneath the suprachoroidal lamina we have a layer of large vessels consists mainly of venules and beneath that we have a layer of medium vessels and beneath the layer of median vessels we have a layer of corio capillaries layer of corio capillaries so these are the layers of choroid and beneath the choroid we have retinal pigment epithelium this layer is pigmented epithelium of retina these are the pigments
so outermost layer is sclera middle layer choroid and innermost layer is retina so what is the mcq here this layer of large vessel has a name called haller's layer h a l l e r apostrophe s what is the name of medium vessels this layer also has a specific name called sattler's s c t t l e r s so these are the two named layers in the choroid so note down the layer just beneath the sclera that is between the choroid and sclera is called suprachoroidal lamina of fusca and the layer between the retina and choroid is called brooks layer you should know the named layers present in the choroid now embryology part here also we are going to talk only about the mcq questions just remember the two terms regarding the embryology of eye neuroectoderm and neural crest cells name the structure developed from the neuroectodermal layer two muscles of iris sphincter pupillae and dilator pupillae two epithelial lining epithelial lining of ciliary body and iris name the structure developed from the neural crest cells see stroma of iris stroma of ciliary body and stroma of choroid so just remember the structure developed from the neuroectoderm and the neural crest cells also remember the melanocytes also develops from this neural crest cells now review on blood supply of uveal tract so you have to just remember two terms regarding the blood supply of uveal tract major arterial circle and minor arterial circle so as we already discussed from the ophthalmic artery we have two important branches long posterior ciliary artery and short posterior ciliary artery as we already know these arteries runs in the suprachoroidal space and pierces initially it pierces the sclera runs in the space anastomoses with the anterior ciliary arteries and forms the arterial circle to understand the arterial circle let's consider the front view so outermost layer is the ciliary body then you have iris and pupil so these are the long posterior ciliary arteries from both the sides so it anastomoses with each other and forms major arterial circle this major arterial circle gives branches to the iris and it forms a smaller arterial circle called minor arterial circle around the pupil so what you have to remember major arterial circle is formed by long posterior ciliary arteries and anterior ciliary arteries and one more circle is minor arterial circle what is the venous drainage of uveal tract single term to be remembered is what explains so this is the eyeball from the posterior view with the optic now you can see four veins on all the sides call vortex veins so the way is called vena vorticosa the superior two veins drains into the superior ophthalmic vein and the inferior veins drains into the inferior ophthalmic vein and where these ophthalmic vein drains 
superior and inferior ophthalmic vein runs backwards to drain in the cavernous sinus so this is the venous drainage of vivial tract what is the nerve supply when we talk about the nerve supply we should know the muscles so in the iris we have two muscles sphincter and dilator pupillae in the ciliary body we have one muscle ciliary muscle so what is the nerve supply of all these muscles what is the fifth cranial nerve trigeminal nerve what are its branches ophthalmic maxillary and mandibular for now consider only ophthalmic branch this ophthalmic branch of trigeminal nerve gives nasociliary nerve and this nasociliary gives a branch called long ciliary nerve sympathetic plexus from the internal carotid artery joins with the long ciliary nerve to supply the muscle called dilator pupillae so you should know dilator pupillae receives the sympathetic innervation so what is the sympathetic response in the eye it is midriasis now remember a clinical condition called horner syndrome here which nerve is involved yes t1 the sympathetic innervation is involved so when the t1 is involved there is paralysis of dilator pupillae and the resulting condition will be meiosis one of the five component of horner syndrome is meiosis we should know the nerve supply of rest of the two muscles sphincter pupillae and ciliaris muscle so this is the cross section of midbrain and the nucleus here you should remember is edinger westphal nucleus the nerve coming out of it is oculomotor nerve which relays in the ciliary ganglion and the post ganglionic nerve is short ciliary nerve which supplies the constrictor pupillae and also ciliaris muscle so the constrictor pupillae and ciliaris gets the parasympathetic innervation so dilator pupillae receives sympathetic innervation ciliaris and constrictor pupillae receives parasympathetic innervation so this is all about the uvl tract